that is. I just turned it on. Thank you. What a morning prayer tape. <coughs> Good morning again. It's wonderful to see everybody here this morning. It's wonderful to see so many people who are willing to uh, miss out on the best opener to be here for this. Um, I uh, see a lot of faces I recognize. Uh, not necessarily everybody's though, so just some uh, uh, information you might need to know. Uh, as you step out the doors to the uh, to the room that we're in here, if you go straight down the hallway, you'll find restrooms for anybody who needs them. You also probably noticed as you came in that there are a number of vendors here today. Uh, I encourage you to stop during the breaks and visit with them. They have a lot of really wonderful information and um, helpful things that um, are associated with uh, our common vision, our common desire to uh, build a more just society. They're going to have an opportunity later on today to um, introduce themselves and uh, give you a better sense of who it is they represent and what it is that they're working on currently. Uh, but please do stop and visit with the vendors. So, Bishop Bruce, we'd like to thank you for being here with us this morning and thank you for leading us in prayer. Uh, in just a moment, uh, Bishop Bruce is going to lead us off with um, our first presentation this morning, talking about some of the principles of building a just society. But before you begin, Bishop, we'd like to offer you a small gift, a token of our appreciation. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for your leadership uh, in our diocese, and particularly around these various issues of um, the church's social teaching that are so dear to us. Thank you. You must think I need to be sweetened up. <laughs> I'm not sweet enough as it is, I guess. No, I'm good. I'm going to move this down here. Well, again, it's great to be with you today, um, you know, for this fall social justice workshop. And, you know, I think it's very important work in the diocese um, and uh, in, in, in your local parishes. You know, it really is. Um, it's the heart of who we are as Catholics is, is finding ways to build a just society. And as you all know, we, you know, the church does have an obligation to participate in shaping the moral character of our society. Um, in fact, it's a, it's a requirement of our faith. Think about that. It's a requirement of our faith. It's a part of the mission that's been given to um, each one of us um, through baptism in Jesus Christ. You know, today as we gather, you know, I was asked to um, reflect with you on the topic of what is a just society. And... I mean, it's a very good question, because depending on what one believes, that will determine how one answers it. Obviously, the, the definition of a just society, from a Catholic perspective, might be different from what people might think from, from a person who is not Catholic, or a person who has no faith, or um, depending on where they might be coming from. Um, and I think the definition of a just society has changed over the past decades. It's been influenced by various ideologies and philosophies and in, in the changing social norms, norms of our society today. You know, as we all know, our country was founded upon Judeo-Christian principles, whereby there was a recognition, always, there was always a recognition of an inherent human dignity as well as equal and inalienable rights of all people. In fact, the founding document of our country, you know, the Declaration of Independence, it reads this, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As we see, these rights are not given to us by the governments. They've been given to us by God himself. And no government has a right to take them away. But the common language with the moral grammar of our founders, which first shaped and directed our nation, I believe has been compromised greatly by a secular humanism and a relativism that is transforming the very fabric of our society today, the very fabric of our country. Another document that's, been, that's very important was um, 
the, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it was for the United, it was, it, was, it, was a, it was written back when the United Nations was established in 1948. And this document opens its preamble with these words. Whereas recognition in the inherent dignity of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. And then it began to enumerate these rights. In Article 1 it says, All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood. The second article says this, Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other, or the other status. And then the Article 3 of this document, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the, pers and the security of person. But I think we could all agree, as we have seen, the United States as a nation and the United Nations as a body of global representatives have both passed laws, have both uh, uh, you know, ad advanced agendas that totally violate a number of the principles established in both of these declarations, which I think in the end has diminished what is deemed a just society. In her book, Non-Negotiable, it's a good, great book, I would encourage you to read it, Essential Properties of a Just Society and Human Culture. It's written by... Um, um, Sheila, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. Laya, well, it's um, L I A U G M I N A S. So I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but this is the book. In her, in this book, she wrote this. She said, "We have an establishment hierarchy of culture shapers today, who hold a shared ideology treated as evolved knowledge, and it's based on a on a secular humanist definition of the person." that doesn't hold up to the scrutiny of reason. It is mostly an atheistic, agnostic view of the universe relying mostly on science with no concept of evil, no concept of the spiritual life or an afterlife, and not based on any doctrine, but only on evolving cultural trends and experiences. It's a relativistic and utilitarian ideology, she says, mostly shielded, shielded from scrutiny by major media who happen to share it. They simply believe it's true and enlightened. I think we would all agree with that. In other words, from their perspective, what they put forth is truth. It's their truth. Pope Francis addressed this recently when he spoke to the joint sessions of the United Nations, or no, I'm sorry, to the United States Congress. He told them this, and I'm going to quote this, he said, each person or each son or daughter of a given country has a mission, a personal and social responsibility. Your own responsibility as members of Congress is to enable this country by your legislative activity to grow as a nation. You are the face of its people, their representatives. And he says, you are called to defend and preserve the dignity of fellow citizens in the tireless and demanding pursuits of the common good, for this is the chief aim of all politics. A, politic, a political society endures when it seeks as a vocation to satisfy common needs by stimulating the growth of all its members, especially those in situations of greater vulnerability or risk. Legislative activity is always based on care for people. To this you have been invited, called, and convened by those who elected you. That's the end of that quote. That was part of his address to the, to the um, to Congress. And as I said, the Judeo-Christian tradition is what has shaped and directed our nation from the very beginning. The characteristically um, Christian element of our nation is its foundation upon the inalienable dignity of the human person. All human beings have been created in God's image and likeness. That's the beginning point the foundational point of a just society that every single person has been created in God's image and likeness.
In other words, the human person is the pinnacle. She says, she says, the pinnacle of God's handiwork. God so loved this human creature that he sent his own son to become one among us, among its members. And not only that, but to give the ultimate sacrifice for our salvation. This is how much God loves humanity. Not humanity in a broad sense, but each and every human person. Especially the smallest, the weakest, the least, the forgotten. Those who are on the, who are on the margins of society. And so no matter what their state or condition might be, people have dignity and deserve to be treated accordingly. You know, the Catholic Church is a foundational principle of the or tenets of Catholic social teaching proclaims that human life is sacred and the dignity of the human person is the foundation of a moral vision for society. So again, the beginning point is the beginning point. The beginning point when we talk about a just society. You know, when we think about the Catholic, uh, the tenets of the Catholic social teaching, you know, they perform this, uh, this framework, they, they provide a moral framework that doesn't fit ideologies of right or left or conservative or liberal or, or the platform of any political party. They're not partisan or sectarian, but they reflect fundamental ethical principles that are common for all people. That comes from forming consciences for faithful citizenship. But they really do speak to what it means to be human. You know, in, the, in Gaudium et Spes, one of the, one of the um, documents from the Second Vatican Council, the Council Fathers wrote this. They said, Christ, the Word made flesh, is showing us, showing us the Father's love. In showing us the Father's love also shows us what it truly means to be human. Christ's love for us lets us see our human dignity in full clarity and then compels us to love our neighbors as he has loved us. And Christ the teacher shows us what is true and good, that is what is in accord with our human nature as free, intelligent beings created in God's image and likeness, endowed by the Creator with, with dignity and rights. That's from Gaudium et Spes. You know, I, I don't believe we will ever have a just society at least a society in which, you know, a just society which, which is in the mind of God, unless it begins here. You know, the sacredness of life and the dignity of a human person begins at conception. And as Pope Francis says, must be protected at every, every stage of its de development. And that even means to death. You know, aren't we continuing to develop in some way, even to the point, even to the moment of death? When he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he wrote this. And he's, he's specifically addressing abortion in this situation, but I think it can go beyond that. He said, the moral problem with abortion is of a pre-religious nature because of the genetic code of the person is present at the moment of conception. There's already a human being. To not allow further progress in the development of a being that already has this genetic code, entire genetic code of a human being is not ethical. The right to life is the first human right. Abortion is killing something that cannot defend himself. You know, certainly there are other life issues which we don't have time to go into right now, but that fall under the sacredness of human life that's under attack today. I mean, we would be here all day. And I think some of the, there'll be some speakers that follow me that can address some of those issues. But as long as li human life is under attack, direct attack from abortion and euthanasia, as long as, as human life is being threatened by cloning embryonic cell st stem cell research, as long as lives um, are being taken through the use of the death penalty, as long as the state is, is, remains an agent of death, as long as innocent people are being targeted for their Christian faith, a just society will not exist at least in, 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 the, in the mind of what God desires a just society to be. But it goes beyond this. You know, as, as I said, a human person is not only sacred, but also is, you know, is, but it's also social. 
You know, so we see the attacks on marriage and family today. You know, marriage and family are the central social institutions that must be supported and strengthened, not undermined. You know, marriage and family today is being undermined all over the place. The Supreme Court decision redefining marriage is one of those laws which severely undermines what marriage and family are meant to be. Um, it severely diminishes a just society because, because when we think about a just society, it's about the common good. You know, and so this redefinition of marriage is not for the common good. It's for the good of a small group of people that have a loud voice and a lot of money. The decision ordered, this decision ordered the transformation of a social institution. The transformation of a social institution that has been the very building block of every society and culture since the beginning of time. And the court has brought this social experiment now into the forefront of our modern American, American society. And I think time will reveal the extent of the destruction that this, is, this decision will have on, this, on, on, on society. But it's, it's unavoidable that it will negatively impact the stability of family life and especially the moral formation and the psychological development of children. So it's not promoting the common good, it's detrimental to our young people. A just society promotes the common good, which is what is best for all people, especially the most vulnerable. Are not children one of the most vulnerable? Don't they fit into this category? You know, before this decision was made back in early 2013, lawmakers in the state of Illinois introduced legislation to turn um, the civil unions <coughs> Um, a civil, you know, to, um, into uh, into the one that redefined marriage, and, and Bishop Propaki, who is a, is a bishop of Springfield, Illinois, in response to this bill that was called the Religious Freedom and Marriage Fairness Act, um, said the bill failed to recognize certain truths about marriage. He said it would enshrine in our law, and thus in public opinion and practice, three harmful ideas. The first one. What essentially makes a marriage is now romantic emotional union. Think about that. I mean, that's what same-sex marriage is, really. What essentially makes a marriage is now romantic emotional union. Secondly, children do not need, it, say, it says, by this, this act says that children do not need both a mother and a father. That's what it says. And thirdly, the main purpose of marriage is adult satisfaction. Think about that. I mean, we look at same-sex marriage, really, that's, that's, it makes marriage a romantic emotional union. It, it says that children don't need a mother, mother and a father, and it's, it's the main purpose of it is adult satisfaction. Cardinal George, uh, Francis George, issued a letter in response to this, um, this free freedom, Religious Freedom and Marriage Fairness Act, saying this, the proposed legislation will have long-term consequences because laws teach Laws are laws teach. They tell us what is socially, socially acceptable and what is not. And most people to conform to the dictates of their respective society. This is what happens next. He says, if we ignore in law the natural complementary, complementarity of a man and a woman in creation, then the natural family is undermined. When the ways of nature and nature's laws conflict with, with, with civil law, society is in danger. Obviously this was more than two years ago before the, the Supreme Court made their decision and now we see clearly the course of direction which this country has taken. You know, So the real question I think for us is how does this Supreme Court decision promote the common good? How does this Supreme Court decision make our society more just? A just society is not one in which laws are created to provide a venue for people to live life according to what satisfies a, spe a specific group of people, especially along uh, w which, especially when it denigrates the family, as God has intended a family to be. But when we think about this decision, you know, you and I, people of faith are being asked to accept this decision in the name of tolerance. No? 
But people of faith are not being tolerated and their rights and religious liberties are being denied. Not a just society. Proponents of same-sex marriage assert that it does not affect traditional marriage. But in a document called the Manhattan Declaration we read this, the truth is that marriage is not something abstract or neutral that the law may legitimately define or redefine to please those who are powerful and influential. No one has a civil right to have a non-marital relationship treated as marriage. Marriage is an objective reality, a covenantal union of husband and wife. That is, it is the duty of the law to recognize and support for the sake of justice of the common good. If it fails to do so, genuine social harm follows. So a just society defends the sacred institution for many reasons. You know, traditional marriage exists as an institution primarily because of, a, of, of the societal value associated with the propagation of the human race. And marriage, we all know, reflects the deep, this deep reality, a, a reality of the unique, fruitful, lifelong union that is only possible when a man and a, um, between a man and a woman. So the attempt to redefine marriage to include two persons of the same sex denies the reality of what marriage truly is. Pope Benedict, back in, in the celebration of World Peace Day in 2013, he clearly stated that the family's role as a basic cell of society cannot be ignored. The family's role as a basic cell, as a basic cell of society, can't be ignored. The family is one of the indispensable social subjects for the achievement of a culture of peace. So he's connecting family to a culture of peace. The rights of parents in their primary role in the education of their children in the area of morality and religion must be safeguarded. It's in the family that peacemakers. Tomorrow's promoters of a culture of life and love are born and matured. So it's easy to see from that why this decision does not help create a just society. Another theme of Catholic social teaching which provides a basis for a uh, just society is how we organize as a society. You know, in our economics and politics and law and uh, in our policy. And these directly affect human dignity and the capacity for people, for human beings to grow, not only as individuals, but grow in community. And our, che our church teaches, always has always taught that the role of the government and other institutions is to protect human life and human dignity and to promote the common good. That's, that's, that's a just society is, 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 if you want a simple definition, it's that. It's a society which pr protects human life and human dignity and promotes the common good. All people have a right to participate in the economic and political and culture, cultural life of a society. It's a fundamental um, demand of justice and it's a requirement for human dignity that all people be assured, of, you know, at least of, of, of a minimum participation in society or in the community. And conversely, it's wrong for a person or a group to be excluded unfairly or to be unable to participate in society. You know, as the U.S. bishops um, have stated, the, ult the ultimate injustice is for a person or a group to be treated actively um, or abandoned passively as if they were non-members. Um, I mean, the ultimate injustice is, is for a person or a group to be treated actively or, a or abandoned passively as, as if they were non-members of the human race. To treat people this way is effectively to say they simply don't count as human beings. In a just society, we believe that the, human, the economy must serve people, not the other way around. And I think this is our challenge today in our marketplace, because all too often, you know, the bottom line takes precedence over the rights of workers. All economic life must be shaped by moral principles. Economic choices and institutions must be judged by how they protect or undermine the life and dignity of the human person, how they 
support the family and how they serve the common good. A fundamental moral measure of any economy is this, is how the poor and vulnerable are faring. All people have a right to life to secure the basic necessities of life. And so society has a moral obligation, including governmental action when necess where necessary, to assure opportunity, meet the basic needs, and pursue justice in economic life. So if the dignity of work is not is to be protected, then the basic rights of workers must be respected. The right to productive work, the right to decent and fair wages, the right to organize and join unions, the right to private property, the right to economic initiative. And the global economy has moral dimensions and human consequences as well. Decisions on investment, trade, aid, and development should protect human life and protect human rights, even for those most in need wherever they might live on this globe. It's a global community. We're all connected to one another, whether we know that person individually or not. They are our brothers and sisters. So Catholic teaching promotes peace as a positive, action-oriented concept. You know, in the words of John Paul II, he wrote this. He said, you know, peace is not the absence of war, just the absence of war. It involves mutual respect and confidence between peoples and nations. It involves collaboration and binding agreements. So there's a close relationship in Catholic teaching between peace and justice. Peace is the fruit of justice and is dependent upon right order among human beings. So, and Pope Francis, I mean, he was very clear when he was in this country that true peace can only come through dialogue. True peace can only come through dialogue. It's very clear on this. Because dialogue opens up new opportunities for all people because, because, because it comes out of a desire to love. You know, it comes out of a desire to love. True dialogue comes out of a desire to love. Think about that. And as he said, it does open up it opens up the possibilities, new opportunities for all people. Another thing we've been hearing recently regarding, I think it's, it's connected to just society, is Pope Francis, he's been very clear about, um, about caring for the environment as a requirement of our faith. We're called to protect people and the planet, living our faith in relationship with all of God's creation and certainly this environmental challenge has, has fundamental and moral and ethical dimensions that can't be ignored. I want to quote him again. This is in a talk that he gave to the United Nations when he was here. He said this, First, it must be stated that a true right of the environment does exist for two reasons. First, because we human beings are part of the environment. We live in communion with it since the environment itself entails ethical limits which human activity must acknowledge and respect. Man, for all his remarkable gifts, which are signs of a uniqueness which transcends the spheres of physics and biology, is at the same time a part of these spheres. He possesses a body shaped by physical, chemical, and biological elements and can only survive and develop if the ecological environment is favorable. Any harm done to the environment, therefore, is harm done to humanity. Secondly, because every creature, particularly a living creature, has an intrinsic value in its existence, its life, its beauty, and its interdependence um, with other creatures. We Christians, together with other monotheistic religions, believe that the universe is the fruit of a loving, decision by the Creator, which permits man respectfully to use creation for the good of his fellow men and for the glory of the Creator. He is not authorized to abuse it, much less to destroy it. In all religions, the environment is a fundamental good. And certainly he said a lot more when, it, when it's talking to Plus, it's just read his uh, encyclical, you know, Laudato Si. You'll, you'll, you'll find more in there about that, but you know, but for the sake of this talk, um, I'm going I'm to end the, re the environment part in connection to a just society.
And I think there's finally there's more traits to really speak about which help define a just society. Um, I mean, we can. There's a lot of things we could go into detail more deeply. Um, but the last one I want to talk about today is one, the battles which we as Catholics face, and many Christians around this country and our world, and that's religious freedom, the freedom to practice our faith in all areas of our lives without government intrusion. We cannot have a just society without freedom of religion. The Constitution guarantees our freedom of religion, not only the freedom to worship. You know, religion involves the totality of our beliefs and convictions, the totality of them, and how the individual should act in relationship to God and in relationship to others. It's not just something we do, it's the way we live. Worship is only one type of action. It's usually liturgical in nature. In nature. So therefore, you and I, we must be free to express ourselves in this way, in every, in, in, you know, in every way in society. Sheila once again wrote this. I'm going to quote her because I think it's, it says a lot. When the Constitution was first drafted, the people of this country wanted more protection of basic rights and liberties. So the first Congress proposed a Bill of Rights, which became the first ten amendments to the Constitution. Ordering them, ordering them was an act of honoring the highest priorities of a nation and a people who wanted to be just and good and have the principles in which they believe protected most. So the First Amendment begins with religious freedom. It's not an accident. It's intentional. The First Amendment begins with re religious freedom and, and both of its twofold protections go together and must be protected. First Amendment religious freedom protection both prohibits an official government-sponsored religion and protects the people in their free exercise of religion. This means that citizens can privately and publicly practice a religion by expressing their beliefs and acting on them in ways they see as moral and rejecting what they believe is immoral. The government cannot compel or co coerce them to be complicit in any action people believe to be immoral. That's the end of her quote. You know, society cannot be just if the First Amendment right is infringed upon. It can, it won't be. As Catholics, we believe the whole of our lives, and I think many, many Christians would believe this as well, not just Catholics, the whole of our life is to be oriented toward God the Creator, the one who gives us life and dignity. A well-formed conscience is morally binding on the individual and all the dimensions of his moral, personal, and civic life, and it formulates his judgments according to reason in conformity with the true good that's willed by the wisdom of the Creator. Freedom must be ordered to truth. Freedom must be ordered toward truth. St. John Paul II wrote in Evangelium Vitae, he said this, Freedom negates and destroys itself and becomes a factor leading to, destruction, to the destruction of others when it no longer recognizes and respects its essential linked link with the truth. This view of freedom leads to a serious distortion of life and society. In this way, any reference to common values and to a truth absolutely binding on everyone is lost, and the social life ventures onto the shifting sands of complete relativism. At that point, everything is negotiable. Everything is opening to bargaining, even the first of the fundamental rights, the right to life. A just society is always oriented toward truth, a truth which is given to us from our Creator. You know, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to bring this to a close. You know, there's so many things we've, which reflected upon the essential elements of a just society. Um, but I want to conclude now with some words spoken by Pope Francis. 
again in his address to the United Nations, which I think in many ways sums up the definition of a just society. And he said this, the common home of all men and women must continue to rise on the foundations of a right understanding of universal fraternity and respect for the sacredness of every human life, of every man and every woman, the poor, the elderly, the children, the infirm, the unborn, the unemployed, the, um, the abandoned, the imprisoned, those considerable disposable because they are only considered as part of a statistic. This common home of all men and women must also be built on the understanding of a certain sacredness of created nature. Such understanding and respect call for a higher degree of wisdom, one which accepts transcendence, transcendence self-transcendence, rejects the creation of an all-powerful elite, and recognizes that the full meaning of individual and collective life is found in selfless service to others and in the sage and respectful use of creation for the common good. And he said to repeat the words of Pope Paul VI, the edifice of modern civilization has to be built on spiritual principles for they are the only ones capable not only of supporting it but of shedding light on it. Thank you. We have time, about 10 minutes for questions, if people have any questions.